everybody's coming in with some different skill set and probably some different ambitions. What are some of those characteristics that lead you to, that, that make a student stand out maybe in the audition process? How do you spot potential? If you've got that overwhelming passion and you want to pursue it, you've got that drive, somehow it's going to happen. Welcome to another episode of Contrabass Conversations, your show covering life on the low end of the spectrum. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and I'm so glad to bring you today's episode featuring James Vandermark. James just celebrated his 40th year of teaching at the Eastman School of Music. And as we were talking, it was just amazing to me the common ground that James and I shared. He grew up not too far from Minneapolis. I also grew up not too far from Minneapolis. He studied with James Clute of the Minnesota Orchestra, as did I in high school. He also studied with several cellists, and I had that experience as well. So we dig into those topics, fascinating topics, as well as so many great things. We just scratched the surface of what James has done in this remarkable career. We talk about boxing and what it's done for both him and his students, the experience of being a professional bassist in a professional orchestra at the age of 17, incredibly young, how he came to join the Eastman faculty also at such a young age in his early 20s. Studying with those cellists I mentioned earlier, Paul Katz and Leonard Rose, what that experience was like, learning how to play for a bigger hall, which is something that he learned from Leonard Rose in part, and learning how to vary sound and color to blend in or project out. And we talk about students, how things have changed in the bass world, spotting potential, so many great topics. You heard a few of them in that quote at the beginning. There's also a great episode from Classical 91.5. The show is called Backstage Pass, and you can listen to the whole thing online. It's a celebration of James and his 40 years at Eastman with performances and interviews with James and several of his students. Definitely give it a listen. And before we get rolling here, I'd like to thank our sponsor, D'Addario Strings, and encourage you to check out their Kaplan Strings. We've got a giveaway for Kaplan's. Ten sets of Kaplan Strings are going to Contrabass Conversations listeners. And the way to get entered for that is ContrabassConversations.com slash strings. Looking at the list of people that use Kaplan's is like a who's who from the podcast. A few of them include, these are just a few, Andres Martin, Anthony Stoops, Klaus Freudenstein, Craig Butterfield, Daniel Kimbrough, David Allen Moore, Gabriele Raggianti, Michael Valerio, and many others are enjoying Kaplan Strings, as am I. So definitely check them out. And thank you also to the Bass Violin Shop. And they offer, in addition to all sorts of services for basses and repairs, they also have a great selection of bass bows. So they have a full line of French and German bows, from entry-level student bow to bows like Frechner, Nuremberger, and other makers like that. And each bow is personally selected prior to sale to ensure that customers can choose from the very best in bows. Check them out at BassViolinShop.com. And we're going to also feature a few selections from James. We've got two excerpts from a performance, a live performance of a work written for James, Shiva Shotkey. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, written by Todd Coleman and performed by James with the University of Rochester Chamber Orchestra. So you'll hear a bit of the first movement and the second movement. You'll also hear a bit of Yak Nasha, the medicine man and his helpers, the translation by Jared Tate, and it's performed with James and the Pro Musica Chamber Orchestra. So I hope you enjoy this conversation and these excerpts from James Vandemark.
where to even begin? I, I, this might be a weird spot to begin, but uh, but I just am so fascinated by, um, and I'm not a boxer. I've never boxed, but I'm just fast. I just love that. And, and I've talked to like Eric Snoza and some of your former students. And, you know, like, could you just talk a bit about how boxing came into your life and like maybe what it's what it's done for you? We, we, could, we could spend the whole episode on that, I'm sure. But <laughs> Sure. So, I mean, it is admittedly a little odd, but I figured that in my, uh, gee, at that point in my mid 50s, I wanted to make certain that I could really keep my career going um, as long as possible. And obviously, many musicians, many string players, um, alas, are sort of afflicted by all sorts of things that interfere with their playing, particularly as they get older. And although I wasn't experiencing that, and luckily I haven't, but I wanted to ensure that I would have a real longevity in my career. And a lot of that, frankly, is not just due to attitude, but it's due to physical health. And uh, I happened to have a neighbor at the time who said that there was this incredible boxing gym in Rochester that provided the most complete conditioning experience that they had. And, you know, I was, of course, eh, skeptical. And although I knew a bit about boxing because my father, um, growing up in the 20s and 30s, had been, as were many young men at the time, he'd done a bit of boxing. And, uh, you know, I used, as a kid, I used to watch the fights on television with him. So I had kind of a passing interest. Um, but I went and uh, was hooked immediately. And it was not really just for the boxing component, but also very much for the conditioning component. And so what I found, of course, that was very intriguing was that much of the basic training is also done in rhythmic patterns. And so there was an immediate link for me as a musician to see that, you know, not just punch combinations, but a lot of drills, whether it's anything from jump rope to speed bag to you name it, um, requires a level of kind of rhythmic coordination that I felt, I mean, admittedly, there's sort of a leap um, to playing the bass, but maybe not so much because playing the bass is also a very engaging and, you know, large muscle group physical activity. And so I found really pretty quickly that stamina, endurance, concentration, and a lot of other things um, were for me enhanced by doing that. And I felt at the time that having had a uh, particularly a number of international students who'd had very, very little uh, physical exercise, frankly. They were great players, but they'd not really done much in terms of, you know, moving their arms, stretching, feeling loose, which is a big component of boxing to do it well anyway. So um, I started bringing them in to work with my trainer there, who's a professional trainer who's trained a lot of Golden Gloves winners. And uh, they loved it and were, you know, would occasionally uh, say, you know, my arms feel so much looser. I feel as though I can move faster. I feel as though my reaction time is better. So I found that there were a lot of components for my students um, that were enhanced not by hitting each other, but by but by going through the drills. I'm the crazy one who goes in and actually fights. And, you know, the challenge for me uh, in that aspect is that here I am at 64 and I'm not a very big guy, as you probably know. Um, I, you know, touch the scales at about 128 pounds. So there aren't a lot of people my age, my size that I can box or spar with. So I'm invariably put in the ring with people who are usually about 30 to 40 years younger than I am. So, um, yeah, so clearly um, the notion of missing notes in a concert, you, you know, that holds some anxiety, but also, you know, you miss notes in the ring, you get hit, right? Um, so it uh, has, for me, oddly enough, kind of an odd transfer of building confidence on stage. Um, and it's sort of, it's just another discipline that requires the same kind of dedication. And frankly, I'm not, you know, I'm, it's, I'm not going to become a professional boxer. I'm too old. But sensing what is involved in that, 
I think is a great kind of parallel to what one can do really at any age, at any skill level as a musician. And we can find that in other disciplines too. For me, I just happened to find it in boxing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the first time I ever thought of boxing and music paired up together, the, I know Miles Davis had a period where he was into boxing and there was a just a wonderful, it might have been a downbeat or something, but it was right around 1970, just a great article about him and boxing. And it was, it was right around when he put out, I think, the Jack Johnson tribute. He was in great shape and just talking about the similarities. And I I heard about that. And I thought it was fascinating. And I, I never really heard about that until I heard about your interest in boxing and developing that. And, you know, yeah. Right. And it's funny that you mentioned Jack Johnson because Jack Johnson was a bass player. No, really? I didn't know yes. that. <laughs> and there's a very brief a clip of him. It's somewhere. It's only about five or ten seconds of him playing the bass. It's archival footage, and he looked pretty good. He apparently loved classical music, and so he played a bit of bass. I mean, he was an amazingly brilliant, skilled guy um, who was obviously the greatest boxer of his time. Um, but, you know, Miles, of course, had Miles had a lot of issues, but he was apparently quite a skilled boxer, kept a heavy bag in his, pra- in his apartment and worked out all the time. So you never know. Um, William Primrose was a boxer as a young man. Really? I didn't know that. Wow. And apparently a pretty good one. Um, More recently, Vladimir Spivakov, the Russian violinist, also was a boxer. Um, Kept it going probably through his late 20s. So there's, you know, a number of people have followed this uh, in the music profession. Well, and I, I love digging into people who have like a physical practice like that and how it, and you know, you're just describing how it's helped you musically and, and, and that's, and just in terms of like developing confidence and what's, what's, a, how does that fit in just in terms of like a daily, like, do you go to the gym every day, a few times a week, sparring a few times a week? How does that look for you? Right. So I will um, hit the boxing gym three to four times a week. And on the days that I'm not there, usually I have a day off completely. But uh, the lighter days, I'll do, you know, 20 minutes of something, you know, here at the house. And, uh, you know, sure, it's, you know, jump rope and other sort of boxing drills and you know, a bit of yoga all the time to do stretching and other things. So it's, it's I'm trying to make certain that it's a fairly complete physical routine, but not one that's always the same. I try to vary it. At the boxing gym, um, you know, I'll spar with somebody once a week. That's about it. And it's generally pretty light sparring. We're not, you know, trying to knock each other's brains out. So (laughs) at least I hope not for (laughs) my sake. Right. But it's all, you know, it's all with, you know, headgear and mouth guards and you know, so yeah, I get an occasional black eye, but that's honestly been it. Okay, I I, I love looking at it, um, the, and I've actually seen you in master class before. I think you you came to Northwestern when I was a student there, and so we're going back in time. Um, so I, just looking at your background, you studied with Jim Clute. I had the opportunity to study with Jim Clute. You know, growing up, um, was was he your introduction to the bass, or like how did you get introduced to the bass? So um, I'm from a very small town uh, south of Minneapolis called Owatonna. And uh, Owatonna, to this day, still has a great orchestra program. And um, my interest in the orchestra, I mean, admittedly, I'm from a musical family. My sister is a wonderful pianist. Her uh, late husband taught at Northwestern. Actually, my sister taught at Northwestern, too, in uh, the community ed department. And uh, so I grew up surrounded by music, and yet I was sort of the black sheep in the family and didn't want to do it at all. And uh, yet when I was uh, 14, it was discovered that I was uh, missing a vertebrae at the base of my spine. And so my hopes to become, you know, the next uh, Gordie Howe, Bobby Hull as a hockey player ended pretty quickly. And uh, so my parents thought that to divert my... uh, rather twisted adolescent energy, um, I might look into music since, you know, there was some sort of background for that. And again, I'd heard all sorts of music as a kid. But um, so I found the high school orchestra. There was a great high school orchestra director, really inspirational guy. 
And he started me on the bass. And uh, after a few months said, you know, you should really go check out Jim Clute in Minneapolis. And uh, so I was Clute's student for three intensive and wonderful and utterly kooky years. <laughs> well, it was Clute, right? What a character. A brilliant man, really insightful, great player, and a phenomenal teacher. And, uh, you know, a one-of-a-kind person and teacher. And uh, I'm very, very indebted to what he did for me. I remember, at least when I was staying with him, he had these large dogs. And I'd go to take <laughs> oh, lessons yeah. at his house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. The poodles, standard poodles, one was named Prescott for all the bases. I mean, that is great. You know, it's just, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. He was such a character. You know, you know, uh, growing up, you know, I'm, if, if someone looks at a map, you're south of Minneapolis. I grew up about uh, about the same distance, a little further west of Minneapolis, you know, just over the Minnesota border in South Dakota. And I also, in addition to Clute, I was studying with the principal cellist of the South Dakota Symphony named Kelly Mickelson, who went to Eastman. Oh, I know who that. Yeah. yeah, yeah studied yeah. with. Wow. Yeah, studied with Paul Katz, you know, and it's like, right. okay, and, and and everybody thought I was totally off my rocker studying with this cellist, um, but I found it so beneficial. And again, like, I love this share come out looking through like what you've done. I, I know the cello has been like a thread line, you know, like in your development, studying with the, how. When did you start working with cellists, and like, how did that d help you d uh, or you know shape you uh, as a musician? Right. Well, it, it was interesting because that certainly when I um, began playing was not on my radar at all. But after um, I, I dropped out of high school and moved to Canada to play principal bass of an orchestra. And uh, at that point, um, I was going from flying from Toronto to Halifax uh, once a month for a lesson with Gary Carr. And uh, I found at a point that I wanted to probably have a little bit more opportunity in terms of growth as a bassist. And I didn't quite know what to do. And remember, this is a long time ago. This is 73 or something. Sure. And, and look, the bass has come a long way since then. And um, so because I was, again, just over the, the border in Canada, I knew that um, the Cleveland Quartet uh, then one of the great quartets in the world was in residence at the University of Buffalo. And they had just succeeded the Budapest Quartet there. And so I would go occasionally uh, in my last year in Canada uh, for a private lesson, uh, both with Paul Katz and then oddly enough, also with Misha Schneider, who'd been the cellist of the Budapest Quartet. And since, of course, we were, I was playing a lot of cello transcriptions at the time, the Schubert Arpeggioni and other things, it was also for insight into what, you know, would come from them. I mean, the music was written for them, and I wanted to see, well, what would you do? And um, I think particularly in the case of Paul Katz, we hit it off. I really wanted to get a college degree <laughs> at some point. So I returned to school there at the University of Buffalo and uh, studied with him uh, for three years, as well as a couple of summers at Aspen, too. And again, it was not just to become to play like a cellist. He actually didn't have me do a lot of um, what many bassists would think of as super cellistic fingerings, but it was frankly a lot of fundamentals, you know, how to play loose, how to control the bow. And I was playing only German bow at that point. So uh, there was a lot of, I mean, he felt as though it was much kind of a challenge for him to take on an admittedly sort of oddball student, a bass player, and figure out how to turn this guy into something. So it was a, you know, a spectacular challenge and also to play for someone, again, who'd studied with Piatigorsky and Casals and Rose and whose standards were just impeccable and who gave me no allowance, you know, no, 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 that's not good enough. I mean, it was polite, but it was understood that, you know, I had to play with uh, as fine an intonation as anybody else did and clarity and everything and everything and you know, so it was a real, you know, it was sort of boot camp, even after Clute and Carr. It was really just an insistence on a very high standard. 
the I, I love to uh, know. So, uh, how did the opportunity to play in Canada materialize? Like, how did that decision? That's an I- interesting, dis, you know, decision to to make. How did that all uh, play out for you? Right. So, um, at the time, what I was doing uh, in high school, my sophomore and junior years, was that I was also playing in the summers. I would play the summer season of the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra as the principal bass. And then I was sort of the extra uh, during the year if they needed a second bass for Pulcinella or something like that, I would I would pop in. Um, so at that time, there was a new orchestra that was being formed in Canada. And a number of us in the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra who had an affiliation with it were recruited to play there. Uh, to come up and uh, join. And it was a chamber orchestra at the time in Hamilton. And uh, it doesn't exist like that at all any longer. It was, a, you know, six years of, you know, funding. And then it sort of vanished in, in, it, in that sense. But so I was recruited by the conductor uh, to come up and play principal. And it was really quite fascinating. And, you know, it was an opportunity. I had one more year of high school. Uh, but I was offered, uh, you know, you can go now. And I, you know, done my audition and trial and they said, sure, come on up and do it. And my parents, uh, fortunately said, sure, you know, go ahead, try it, see what happens. And, um, luckily I, I was accepted to college there at McMaster University as a part-time student also. So I did kind of begin college there, but the uh, difficulty was that the demands of the orchestra were so extensive um, that uh, after a year of uh, school, I said, I I really have to play in the orchestra full time. I can't carry a course load. But it was a very fine orchestra. It was also the spot where the Canadian brass got started. They were the principal brass players. And the other principal string players included the the Prague Quartet, the Czech Quartet, the principal ba- the principal players rather of the Prague Philharmonic under Carl Anscherl. The recruitment brought in a lot of players from the National Arts Center Orchestra and the concertmaster of the Toronto Symphony. So it was a really good moment in time to be playing as a kid in a good orchestra. And uh, it taught me a lot, to say the least. And, uh, you know, I'm forever indebted for that kind of once in a lifetime experience at a very young age. Yeah. And and to have that kind of opportunity at a very young age. Right. And then and then, you know, like going ahead a few years, obviously, like uh, joining the Eastman faculty at what people would consider a very young age for that. You've been you've been in that position several times in life. And like maybe if we start with the with the orchestra, like what was that experience like being uh, you were probably either the youngest member of the orchestra or one of the youngest members. So how was that experience fit? in what 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 did you what did you learn what did how how did that work for you well so i i became principal base at age 17 and i quickly learned that i was a colossal idiot <laughs> <laughs> i mean really you know um you know it's always nice to claim oh i, I knew all that and look clute train the crap out of me you know i mean at for orchestra excerpts and he knew that this was coming down the road and i mean i'd had even when i began with him he started me on a whole drill of excerpts but knowing that the position was coming um there were even more and so i think in a sense i came in fairly well prepared but of course playing in an orchestra and particularly as a principal it's also a social skill and working with players who are much older than you are, ha, um, well, let's say it was a great learning opportunity. And, you know, sure, I, you know, I think I learned and I, I listened. I was told, make certain you listen to people who know more than you do and who are older and more experienced. And... You know, I tried to drop as much of the arrogance of a 17 year old as possible and really get in there and figure out, well, you know, you want to do this, these sorts of things by consensus and approval and goodwill. And that's kind of the way to make things work the best as a principle and how 
at times, yeah, sometimes you have to say, well, really, it should be done this way. Or in working with a conductor, conductors, you know, it's all different. And uh, it was also a real challenge because there were a lot of people in the orchestra who were not particularly fluent English speakers. Uh, there were a lot of Europeans, a lot of Czechs, a lot of Hungarians, and many who had recently come over because of the 1968 uh, Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia. There were a lot of Hungarians in the orchestra. Uh, so it was a fantastic mix. And yet to kind of go from a resident conductor, Boris Brat, to, you know, playing a lot of Pops concerts with Arthur Fiedler, who is just an unbelievable, wacko and hilarious tyrant. It was, you know, it was every day was a new experience as a teenager. Having that experience as a young player, and I'm sure just the, like, and then fast forwarding a few years to your early 20s and, and the Eastman job appearing, you've already kind of at that point had like a full career worth of experiences, even as a young age, you know, if it, you look at it a certain way, like, can you just talk through how the position of Eastman opened up and materialized just kind of that, that whole uh, scenario? Sure. So um, what had happened was that um, I was studying in Buffalo at that time uh, with Paul Katz. And um, I was sort of trying to figure out in my senior year of college what I was going to do with myself. And the plan as it sort of was evolving was that I was either A, going to take orchestra auditions, and that I'd been invited to do some principal auditions for some orchestras in the U.S., or I was going to go... Um, continue studying with Leonard Rose at that point at, at Juilliard because I'd been studying with him at Katz's suggestion privately. But what had happened also was at that point, Oscar Zimmerman, uh, my predecessor at Eastman, who'd also been there for many, many years, was retiring. And so they were looking for, you know, a replacement. And um, I was invited to come over and uh, give a class. And uh, apparently it went fairly well. And uh, so, the, you know, there was the usual sort of conversations about X, Y and Z. And uh, lo and behold, I was I was asked to come. And so that sort of settled what I was going to do. And it, it was, again, sort of like going into the orchestra in a different sense. Um, I was just a little bit older than most of the students. Some of them were older than me. But I think, again, it was sort of a lucky break uh, in that I had a lot of good students early on. And I think what I did particularly then was figure out I was in a position to try and fuse what I'd learned from from Clute, from Stuart Sankey, from Gary Carr, and uh, then my studies with other jealous and try to figure out, you know, and I, and I made it very clear, I'm not training you guys necessarily to do what I might have done. You know, I may not be playing in an orchestra now, but that is my background. And I was also excited to see that there were students at Eastman who wanted to be jazz players and, and had a lot of potential. That was a new twist for me. And, um, uh, I kind of rapidly, well, I hope rapidly figured out that you have to have a balance to figure out that, you know, everybody's coming in with some different skill set and probably some different ambitions. And if you can kind of direct a kind of central core of study 
for these people who all have their very valid routes and roles in music that they want to play. It's actually going to be more fun than saying, hey, Joe and everybody else, you're all going to be cookie cutter copies of me, which is, yeah. I mean, to me, that <laughs> I, I, I saw that as a student and I, I never wanted that. Um, so it's been fun. I'm I'm sure, and I'd love to, and, and I, you know, and having the the four decades at East Med, sure, and and sort of witnessing everything that's changed in the bass world from then to now. We're talking about radical change, but before I, I, I just I got to ask. So Leonard Rose, you were taking lessons with Leonard Rose, like one of the great. What was a Leonard Rose lesson like? Yeah, well, that was a real experience. Uh, so I met him because he'd been a soloist with um, the orchestra in Canada quite a few times. And again, then through Paul Katz, who'd introduced me. And what I do is that there were a couple of sort of staples in my recital repertoire that um, I wanted to do for him. One was the Schubert Arpeggioni, which he played a lot. And then the other was the Baccarini A Major Sonata, which I did a lot then, haven't recently. But anyway, so going in, first of all, he was very polite and also kind of reserved and you'd say hmm hmm well here's what you might do and there was this kind of low you know voice of god speaking to you and i guess one of the things that always i'm actually always reminded of is his sound and the sound had a dark richness to it which is something that i think Many bass players, like I would say, I, I would aspire to. It had a core and a projection. And I mean, the reviews always said of Leonard Rose, the sound was pure gold. So you'd go into his studio at Juilliard and he'd be sitting with his Amati cello, you know, 10 feet away. And so he'd say, all right, so what if you try this? And then he'd play a phrase now 10 feet away. That pure gold sound was like, you know, it was like, and, and, and I thought at the first lesson, huh, what are, are all the reviews wrong? I mean, I've heard him, but it was always a little further away. And he caught once my reaction to that. And he said, I'm trying to play for a bigger hall. I said, got it. And so he said, one of the things that will be important for you, speaking to me, is what I, referring to himself, Leonard Rose, did as an orchestra player, because, of course, he'd played principal cello in many situations. He said, you need to know how to vary what you do. And you need a kind of infinite variation of sound, color to blend in or to project out. And it was something that was he was very, very emphatic about and uh, insisted on an enormous range of dynamic and color, and it was really intriguing to see. And I'd gotten some of that, but never to that extent. The other fascinating thing in a lesson with Leonard Rose at that time was to hear him talk about one of his cello students who was, is my contemporary in age, whom I don't know well, but had met a couple of times, and that was Yo-Yo Ma. So, he would always say, oh, Vandermark, you know, I find you're kind of an interesting challenge, but ah, uh, this guy, Yo-Yo, you know about Yo-Yo. I mean, and then he'd have these kind of approving complaints of this guy who was clearly a talent off the charts. But that would work its way into a couple of lessons. What am I going to do with him? <laughs> huh? Yeah. So obviously things change and things evolve for for all of us as teachers and players. And I think in, in retrospect, coming back to hear how Leonard Rose would actually say, you know, I don't think yo-yo practices enough. <laughs> yeah, stuff changes, right? You know, so and I when I replay that, I think, you know, I'm certain that some of the things that I may be encountering with my students now will transform so much. And it's just having the kind of belief in the student and the support for their beliefs of what they want to do 
that might make for a successful career. Rose clearly did that in spite of the complaints. Wow. What, what an experience to be compared to somebody like Yo-Yo Ma, you know, like before, after uh, that, that's, uh, yeah. yeah. Like, that's, <laughs> it was, yeah, it, it was really, really quite shocking, actually, so... Well, and just you, you, you just uh, touched upon it, but like that whole like student evolution, thing, you know, like you've, you've worked with so many students and seen so many, you know, 17 year old, 18 year olds come into audition for you. And I, and, and I, I find it so fascinating. I used to teach at DePaul and, and see these, these, Great you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And see these people come in and just like spotting potential in somebody. I, I, I'm sure you've thought a lot about this. You even, you hit on that a bit in that interview, I think uh, recently, like what, what are some of those characteristics that lead you to th- th- that make a student stand out maybe in the audition process how do you spot potential right well yeah it's interesting and there is no one way and i think everybody's going to have their own sort of i mean we have kind of a plan of what we would like to hear that's very concrete and probably formalized and then i think each of us probably has some sort of instinctive sense of this person really has commitment or personality, intelligence, some sort of oddball musical ability. And it's kind of weighing a lot of those things because for many at 17, it's not all formed. And yet there will be one characteristic of that person that's playing for you that might be so surprising that you know, you want to take a chance on it. Yeah, a lot of the students that come in, particularly now as opposed to 40 years ago, will come in with a high-level concerto that's really pretty well prepared. And things that 40 years ago, you know, if you saw someone play Capuzzi pretty well, well, that, that was great. And hey, it can still be great. But I know certainly in the case of some unusual students, they would come in with... I'm thinking of one Kave Rastigar, who's uh, mainly known as a jazz rock player, um, but came in as kind of both classical and jazz player at Eastman. And uh, his audition for me, which happened in Colorado, was actually playing the Bach cello suites on the electric bass. And they were really good. And it was really musical. And I, and I said, okay, so let's see what else. Can, can you play the upright bass? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, was it polished? No, not to the level that the electric bass playing was. But I thought, what? this guy's really got something. And it turned out that he had this kind of overwhelming passion for music. And I guess for anybody, classical jazz anything if you've got that overwhelming passion and you want to pursue it you've got that drive somehow it's going to happen you know it uh, maybe in spite of your teacher right and so i know in his case he came and became really one of the top classical players here but it also i mean he went on is on this insane wonderful trajectory as a jazz pop player with knee buddies been nominated for a Grammy. He appeared in La La Land because he's John Legend's bass player. So, uh, you know, uh, that's pretty good. And it was all from hearing from, from me, you know, hearing uh, the Bach cello suites on electric bass, but he also continued that so that his um, classical recital at Eastman included, in fact, a bowed version of, I think he maybe played the third suite of Bach and a couple of standard pieces. And then he did his own arrangement of the Messian Quartet for the End of Time that included electric bass, electric guitar, trumpet, and drum set. And it was, it was amazing. And that's the sort of originality and creativity that you know, uh, I can't do that, but it sure is fun to hear it, right? And uh, so I like to see things like that. Well, talk about, talk about, yeah, n- the, an example of not having a cookie cutter student set up, right? Like, yeah. And, but, but being able to spot that passion, like you're describing, I love that. That's such a great uh, sort of through line with, with, with like what, what propels someone towards success. And I love, I love that, you know, there's no formula, but just that, that passion is so, 
so key. Um, I, I, I'm, th- I'm thinking about something you were talking about with Leonard Rose and and hearing him up close and how he's he's playing for a larger hall play, and hearing that I remember even hearing that in b- people I've studied with and like it was mentioning that cellist Kelly Mickelson that went to East sure. her yeah. describing yeah. that yeah. and like and how do you um, how do you work with students like like what, what are some exercises you work with or how are what are some approaches you take to developing that stage sound and that that wider tonal palette like what, what do you do with your students kind of a wide topic I know but <laughs> no 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 I mean it's it's not even that the, the topic is frightening, but the the challenge of getting students to recognize the range of what they need to do is so important. And I think one of the things, very basis of it, I guess for me, is making certain that a student can play a good legato. It seems it seems simple, and yet. I think many string players find a really beautiful legato at any dynamic level a real challenge. And so whether it's through scales, slow scales, bowing patterns, you know, slur two, bow two, three, four, five. A lot of people can't, you know, bow five, separate five, do it metronomically with skill and then a beautiful sound. Um, but to be able to go through drills like that builds up a kind of confidence in the bowing and a loose, easy set on the string, but one that can range from being very powerful, which, again, is a real sensitivity of you know contact point, weight, speed, and then moving it back to something that, you know, you're playing an orchestra audition. And this is not the time to sound like Leonard Rose playing Shalomo. And... It's a recognizing what to do. And a lot of it is kind of practice modeling. So what I do, um, I don't play a lot at my students' lessons sometimes, but I always have a bass there and or I will use their instrument um, to kind of show, well, here's, here's some possibilities and here's how you would, might be able to do it. And then I usually present to them, what's your choice? How would you like to do it? Can you describe it? And then we see if we can find it, whether it's going to be in an exercise, in a phrase from, you know, an excerpt, a solo, whatever. I mean, there's so many components. And so it's, I mean, I use a lot of standard stuff, but frankly, what I find uh, or have found is that often the information that goes with the material is more important than the material and developing the student sensitivity because they're only going to see me for a few years and I want to see them grow way after they're done with me. That's, you know, I think the goal is long term as well as short term. Yeah, you think about even under the best circumstances, they're spending an hour in a lesson plus yeah. maybe a studio class versus the amount of time they're with the instrument, let alone post school, how many years they're going to be with the instrument. So, so developing that that attitude and mindset of, of what to really listen for and improve. Yeah, that's so critical. Yeah. So, I mean, I hope that wasn't an evasive answer, but there, but there, there are a lot of components and, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting on the bass because you can also push the sound too much and then it's just not attractive. It sounds sort of, you know, hysterical and how to judge what is attractive and yet something that can come out in one setting or another and what's appropriate for any setting so that there's no one given sound. Yeah, we'll all have our own individual somethings, but uh, how to make that appropriate so that, frankly, we're employable. Well, uh, and another big question. So, but my, but you, you know, you've been at Eastman for decades at this point and probably thought a lot, but like, and I mentioned this earlier, but, but uh, just base here in 2017 and then we rewind, mm-hmm. say, 40 years. Yeah. What's, and, and again, big question. What's different? Wow. I know. Uh, I know. <laughs> what, what isn't different? Um, I mean, so first of all, the standard of almost everything we can name is higher and the expectations are higher. It's, it's terrific. So that, um, I mean, we'll see, you know, so many young players who have far more fluid technique, more facility, 
um, more bow control. We have a bigger repertoire and a more diverse repertoire. And I think um, one of the things from uh, all sorts of contributors here of uh, compositions, we have a range of stuff from world music, basically to, you know, very uh, scholarly uh, and brilliant works written for the bass. We've got all sorts of things to draw on. The teaching materials are now so diverse and varied. So it, it's just a raising of everything, intonation, sound quality, vibrato, um, sophistication and awareness of how to achieve a technique. I mean, it, it's, it's really completely different. It's been just an absolute um, godsend to the instrument to have this transformation in 40 years. You know, I, I love looking at, uh, like we were chatting when we started about Eric Steffens, who's a student of yours mm-hmm. at, at Eastman. Yeah. I, he studied with me in high school. And then some other people like Eric Snoza, former student sure. of yours. And, yeah. and, then, uh-huh. and then just all the different ways that your students have found a career in music. And, and there, there's so much we can do in this world, uh, in the music world. And then I think, you know, I, these days I teach a lot of high school students and I get the quest. The parents are interested in maybe having them pursue music, but they're worried about what they're going to do for a living. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. and I, you've probably had this conversation either with your students or potential students or parents. Like, And, and it, there is so much we can do, like your, your students have done or are doing. But like, what are, what are some things you tell students and parents that are thinking about jumping into this crazy world of ours? Right. Well, well, you described it perfectly, actually. Um, but it but it is that. And um, I think, you know, much as we like to think that 16 and 17 year olds have an incredibly open mind, some do, but most of them just aren't aware of the possibilities yet. And oftentimes the parents are not either. So one of the circumstances I usually describe to parents who are nervous about their students is in a circumstance that happened for me, I guess it would have been about four years ago. So this was the first year of the, uh, I believe it's called the National Youth Orchestra, which was the, you know, select high school group that at that time went to Russia. Uh, under Gergiev. That's not going to happen this year. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so in that first year, I think there were two principal bassists. One of them was my high school student named Matt Burke, who's currently studying with me at Eastman. The trip was organized by a young man who worked for Carnegie Hall, who organized the whole NYO experience. He was my student, Joe Susi. Um, the principal master classes in the United States were conducted by another one of my students, Jeff Turner. And then the physician on tour <laughs> with the orchestra was another one of my students, Dr. Josh Miller. And so I said, there's a variety of things. Um, yeah, the physician thing, it's still sort of related and Josh still plays, but there's a range of careers in music. And sure, if you begin with the basis of learning how to play at a very high level, indeed, you may go on to a position in an orchestra, which will be great, and I will support you all the way. And if you happen to go off into administration, that's also very interesting, or something else. So it's, you know, it doesn't mean that there's one way to both make a living, but frankly, to be happy. You know, although making a living and being happy is probably connected to right to, to some degree, hopefully. <laughs> and, and, you know, people think, oh, well, it's not a sure thing. Well, what is a sure thing? You know, I mean, that's the, and, and as you know, automation takes over and all the things the articles I read on a daily basis, you know, like uh, so many careers are starting to resemble what we musicians have have experienced right. for a long time. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And it's so I mean, there is. Um, For example, in Eric Snows' case, that is a great example of entrepreneurial skills. Look at what you're doing. I mean, that's pretty interesting. I never would have thought. Yeah, I never would have thought I would be doing this if you'd asked 18-year-old Jason. That's for sure. Yeah, well, me too. (laughs) Asking the 18-year-old me, who knows? One answer, I'm certain. And things (laughs) evolve. So, and that's fine. 
Uh, th- th- James, this is fan- I'm, I'm so glad that it- thank you so much for doing this. This is this Bye. is great. And, and like I said, like w- I'd love to have you back. And we're, we've like scratched like one percent of those of what we could talk about. Um, and I do. And speaking of eighteen year old James, the, the only question I sort of have that's scripted out. Sure. And and again, I love the wide you know question. I love lobbing these giant questions at people. So apologies okay. in advance, but no. go back to go back to let's say seventeen year old James. That's a good sure. transition right. point. Now, being an Eastman, 40 years, all that you've done in your career, advice you might have for that young James walking into that orchestra job. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. Keep your nose clean, kid. Um, <laughs> other than that, um, it was that. And a lot of it is recognizing that y- you have to work very hard but you also have to treat people very well. And I think that's one of the things um, I actually try to emphasize in my studio is that you treat everybody with respect. You know, people who have differing opinions, fine. Treat everybody with respect because our reputation in music is based not only on how we play, but it's based on, you know, can we work with this person? You know, is this person fun to play with? Is this person a a colossal jerk? There are a lot of colossal jerks in our profession. And, uh, you know, I don't want my students to be any of them. You know, we do if if that respect for others and respect for their ideas as musicians, particularly that I think is is so critical because, uh, again, a lot of 17, 18 year olds, uh, you know, think, eh, you know, they're on top of the world. There's some other 15 year old who's even more on top of the world somewhere. So just, you know, be content with being who you are and recognizing the skills and the abilities of others. Thanks again, James. So great chatting with you. Boy, I hate interrupting this cool piece. Isn't this a cool piece? It's just one of many contributions James has made to the bass world. These commissions, these pieces that have been written for him, all the work he's done these 40 years at Eastman. So thank you on behalf of the whole bass community. Thank you, James, for what you're doing with the instrument for education, for broadening the repertoire, all these things, such significant contributions. And so great to catch up with you. This is the sort of conversation that I love to have. And it's such a privilege to be able to have this conversation. A, I appreciate so much people taking the time and chatting and then having the added benefit of being able to put it out into the world like I do every week with these episodes. So I really hope that you enjoyed this episode. And if you'd like to help out the podcast, what you could do is share this episode. You can click that button. If you're listening on your phone, just share it out to Facebook, share it out wherever you hang out online. If you don't do that right now or you're running and you can't do that or you're driving, please don't do that if you're driving. But when you get home, go to ContrabassConversations.com slash James Vandemark and share that episode. We've got sharing buttons right there. You can spread the word about any one of these hundreds of episodes and I would appreciate it so much. It does more good for the show than you can imagine. If there's one thing you could do to help this show continue to grow and reach more people across the globe, it's sharing it. You might not think it's a big deal. It's a huge deal. More than anything else, that's what helps. So thank you for listening. I really hope that you enjoyed this. I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to listen to this. I hope it was inspiring that you learned something, and I can't wait to bring you more episodes like this. Follow along. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, go to however you listen to podcasts. If you don't know what podcasts are and you're just finding this randomly online, you can go to ContraBaseConversations.com. We talk you through the whole process. Search for us in iTunes. Search for us in Stitcher. 
We're everywhere that you listen to podcasts. And by the way, we have an app, ContraBaseConversations.com slash app. Or if you just go to your app store on your device, search for ContraBase Conversations or even ContraBase or Double Base, it should come up. Subscribe to the app. You can get the podcast that way. Thanks again for listening and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.